About three or four months after Bob Jones passed away this year, the Lord began to speak to me late spring, early summer about moving to Moravian Falls, North Carolina. Now, Moravian Falls had, has always been a favorite. Uh, Bob had seen it in a vision many, many years ago and prophesied about it, that there was a mountain he saw where it was uh, 100 miles north of Charlotte and about 40 miles east of the Tennessee border. At that intersection, there was a mountain with a white buck on it, but it would be a mountain of prayer and, and a mountain full of angelic presence and God's presence at the top of this mountain. And so they began looking for where this would be. Lo and behold, uh, a, a while later, they found this exact spot north of Statesville, North Carolina, where the Moravians from Herrenhut, Germany, uh, under Count Zinzendorf had come over and settled in Pennsylvania. They had settled in North Carolina near Winston-Salem. Well, they had settled up near this mountaintop on this mountaintop. And for 100 years, they had a 100-year prayer movement where it was 24-7, day and night prayer for 100 years by these faithful Moravians. Well, you can't have 100 years of that kind of devotion and prayer before the Lord, where the glory of the Lord is present day and night for 100 years without there being this sustaining presence of God. Well, when they found the mountain, they found the presence of God. And they found that uh, some people had already settled there that were believers. Well, then more and more people began to build there and realized that as they built, as they moved into this region that Bob had seen in a vision, that the, the more angelic activity really was released until there were these unbelievable stories going everywhere of things, divine appointments and divine things happening on top of Moravian Falls at this mountaintop. And it became a retreat. It became where uh, all Christians from everywhere began flooding this place to experience things of God that were unusual, supernatural. So when the Lord told me, began stirring me, go to Moravian Falls, I want you to live there. You know, I began to move into that. When you hear from the Lord, you begin to step in faith towards that. You may not have it for a while, but he wants our faith to go in action and step into it, step towards it. So that's what you do. If he gives you any kind of vision uh, for a home, for a place, uh, for property, for a ministry, you step into it. What, what we do on our part is to go looking by faith. And then he, it's up to him to do the rest. If we never go looking until we got the money, until we got everything in place, we may miss it. So it's important to go looking. So it's important for people to go looking when Bob said the word. Go walk it out. Go find it. Well, ultimately, he led them there because they were in motion. If you need to be moving towards a vision, towards a dream, you ask Holy Spirit to come fill your sails. So if you have your sails full, then the wind can take you where you need to go. He'll guide the rudder. But if you never begin moving towards it or begin stepping towards it, you can't find it. And that's what happens with faith. If we begin stepping into the faith, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We begin stepping into faith and it becomes substance. So I began moving towards Moravian Falls by at least going up and looking for property. And as I went up to go looking for property, I found this one cabin that was extraordinary near the top of the mountain. And um, I went to visit this place and a woman who owned it. And she took me inside. The moment I walked inside, I knew this was the place. There were so many things about it that I clearly knew were me or were, were things about it that had to do with my life. Boy, I knew in a moment. This is the one for me. As I walked around, I took pictures, had conversations, asked a lot of questions about it. Uh, and then she took me outside, and we went up to this upper hill behind it where you could build a, a larger place. And I walked up the hill with her to the back of the property and surveyed it all. And I had Bob's staff with me, the shepherd's rod that he gave me. And it was, I was just walking with it. I felt just in, in that time to take Bob's staff with me and uh, mark out the land and kind of claim it, just have my shepherd's rod there to put it on the land. Well, I'm walking back down the hill. She's walking ahead of me, and she stops on the side of the road looking into the woods. She's just kind of looking into the forest, the woods there. And I'm thinking, why she stopped there? And I'm about 10 feet behind her, and as I'm getting up close to her, suddenly I'm, I walk through this thing, and it felt like a veil, like a thick dimensional veil. It sounds strange, but I could feel the difference in the air in my, my face as though I walked through some kind of silky veil. It felt very strange, but I knew in a moment in my spirit it was a portal. You're like, well, what's a portal? Uh, it's like Jacob's ladder in Genesis 28, 10 through 17, where Jacob went to, to seek the Lord, and he laid down on that rock. And of all things, a portal opened up, what we call a portal, and uh, the ladder came down, and angels were ascending and descending on the ladder. And he said, well, uh, of course, this is the place of God. This is the house of God, and I'll read it to you. When Jacob departed from Beersheba and went towards Haran, he came to a certain place and spent the night there. Because the sun had set, he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and laid down in that place. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on earth, and its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So I knew, even scripturally, I knew about portals. I had been in portals before at different times. This one was clearly a portal. And when I walked into it, she's standing over there, and I was going to say, Whoa, this is a portal. The moment I was about to say it, she said, This is a portal. Right as I'm going to say, This is a portal. She said it with her back to me. Not even knowing I'm going to say this is a portal. She says, This is a portal. And I'm like, Whoa, this is a portal. I stepped into it, and I'm there. It's probably 10 feet in diameter, at least that I'm in this circular portal with her. And it's kind of a shaft that goes to heaven, to the third heaven, where angels ascend and descend on this ladder, what we understand as a ladder. Well, they come into the earth this way. They come into the earth through gateways and portals. That's how they travel into the earth. And so I knew this was a gateway. Oh my goodness, it's on the property. It's on the very property of the house. And I've got Bob Shepherd's rod with me. I step up next to her. It's this afternoon, it's a sunshine. It's a blue Carolina sky day, the sun's setting. And it's just totally blue and, and perfect, except there's one cloud in the sky above us. And I'm looking around thinking, I cannot believe, I know that I'm actually standing in a portal with this person who owns the property that the Lord is leading me, quickening me to buy the property from. How many people know they have their own portal on their own property? My goodness, it's like Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration who said, let's build some tents right here. So I'm thinking, 
this, this is where I want to camp out, not even in the house. I want to try to camp out here where something happens in the spirit. So um, I'm standing there looking at the woods with her, with Bob Shepard's rod. And, you know, I just do this when I minister to people. I have the rod with me, and I feel a quickening to kind of say, here, you take it. When they hold on to it and I pray for them, it is the rod of God. There's something special about holding Bob Jones' shepherd's rod and feeling the power and presence of the Lord when you take hold of it. And uh, I can't explain it. It's just something that happens. And I have faith that when people hold it and touch it, when I pray for them, there's an extra impartation. And it, it's extraordinary. So I'm standing there with her, and I just get this on. I said, well, why don't you hold it? And that's what I said. She's looking in the woods, and she leans to, to me and takes it in her left hand. Just the moment she takes hold of the staff, do you know what happened? All of a sudden, that one cloud in the sky burst open upon us. Literally. The rain burst open right down upon us from this one cloud in the sky. The moment she took the rod, it starts raining and drenching us just in the portal. It's literally raining a, a downpour of rain right upon us in the portal as she's holding the rod. We're laughing like little kids. I'm totally beside myself. You know, not in a million years, but only the Lord. The Lord wanted to do that as a sign and as a wonder, just because he does those things to little kids, to people with childlike hearts. Was that a confirmation to me? Yes, it was. Of course it was. Of knowing that the supernatural, I'm in the midst of God, in the midst of this arena where the Moravians prayed for 100 years, where things happen. Am I going there to be a part of those things? No, I'm going there because the Lord's speaking to my heart. Go to Moravian Falls. Well, you know whether it's Moravian Falls or not, if you obey God and you step into that moment, he's going to do things in your life to confirm to you you're on the right track. And that's what he did to me. I'm reading an article from Deception Bites, The Hidden Agenda of the Order of the Mustard Seed. What? Okay, the reason I'm reading this is because this is written by Michelle McCumber. She is a writer and researcher who spent close to 20 years deeply indoctrinated by ne the Neo-Pentecostal Dominionist agenda. After a long period of study and detoxification, she made it her mission to educate others on the dangers of apostate faith and to, and to instill in them a desire for sound biblical doctrine. Okay, so she was part of Rick Joyner's church. And that is where Moravian Falls is located on the property. And I just did a uh, video about Bobby Connor talking about Moravian Falls. And it all, it's all a weird, long story, so... Here we go. Peter Grieg of the 24-7 prayer movement, an international ecumenical movement laced with Gnostic New Age and contempl contemplative spirituality, is reviving the 17th century mystical Masonic order of the mustard seed. Recruited members are required to take lifelong vows of commitment to the order, and the outward sign of this commitment is to be symbolized with a ring or a tattoo. Hmm. The Order of the Mustard Seed was originally a secret order started by Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf and is listed in the History of Freemasonry by Al Albert G. Mackey as being a long dormant Masonic order. Grieg claims he was inspired to resurrect the order by the 18th century Moravian renewal and the life of Count Zinzendorf. Understanding the significance of the resurrection of this order and of the overall resurgence in the interest in Zinzendorf is key to understanding the state of the apostate church and where it's headed. The self-proclaimed apostles and prophets of the New Apostolic Reformation embrace a worldview by which they fancy themselves God's champions. They believe in and are striving towards bringing heaven to earth through a takeover of the world's systems. Pause. I also just did a short video about Kabbalah and Shekinah and bringing heaven to earth. Unpause. Which will place them in control through a hierarchical grid of worldwide apostolic networks. Interestingly enough, it is these same apostles and prophets that appear to press, I mean, possess such rabid fascination with Zinzendorf and the Moravians. Why are so many of those who champion a worldwide ecumenical movement so enraptured by the Moravians. Why do the Moravians wield this kind of influence over this new breed of Christian emerging in today's postmodern church world? It is curious that the same ones who claim God is doing a new thing would be so enraptured by a man who died 300 years ago. In order to understand the horrific significance of the resurrection of this order and the overall draw to, of Zinzendorf's Moravianism, it is first imperative to understand the history of the movement and how it fits together with the stringent social and political agenda of today's self-proclaimed apostles. The Moravians were a Gnostic sect that was founded in 1457 in what is today's Czech Republic. 
They were an offshoot of the Bohemian Brethren, but in 1467 they constituted themselves a church, thereby severing themselves from their association with the National Bohemian Church. Bohemia is a historic region in Central Europe which occupied two-thirds of today's Czech Republic. It is bordered by Poland, Austria, and the Czech historical region of Moravia. In Bohemia and Moravia, the Moravian sect grew rapidly to about 400 congregations in the early 16th century. The Lutheran movement in Germany brought attempts to unite the Moravians under the Lutheran denomination. However, the Calvinistic Reformation saw the Moravians align more in, in its favor. When the Anti-Reformation ensued, merciless persecution by the Catholics extinguished most of the Protestants in Bohemia and completely wiped out the Moravians in Bohemia. However, a few of the Moravian families held on in the region of Moravia. In 1722, they left their homes, land, and belongings and journeyed to Germany in search of religious freedom. By invitation, they settled on the estate of Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf, and eventually built a town there called Hernhut. The new church settlement initially went back to its Bohemian roots. However, Zinzendorf, who eventually settled among them, was Lutheran, and agreement was eventually reached between the Bohemian and Lutheran factions. It's my opinion, after reading several modern historical accounts and other accounts written by Zinzendorf's contemporaries, that the count may have started off with sound doctrine. However, reports from the community at Hern Hut from eyewitness accounts in historical records indicate that they most certainly did not retain Orthodox doctrine as the settlement evolved. Zinzendorf the Rosicrucian Zinzendorf was a Rosicrucian. In late medieval Germany, the Rosicrucians were a secret society of mystics holding a doctrine built on esoteric truths and secret doctrines of the ancient past. Uh, Kabbalah, probably. They believed that these secret mystical truths were concealed from the average man and reserved for an elite few. Much like today's new apostolic reformers, these mystics sought a universal reformation of mankind. Many modern esoteric orders and secret societies are said to draw in part or in whole on the Rosicrucian's philosophies. Zinzendorf was head of the Rose Cross, Rosicrucian from 1744 to 1749. In fact, Masonic dictionaries list a category called Moravian Masonry, which was founded in 1939, called the Confraternity of Moravian Brothers of the Order of the Religious Freemasons. An alternative order, an alternative order was the Order of the Grain of Mustard Seed, which itself originated in 1922 through Count Zinzendorf. Members of the order wore a ring on which was inscribed in Latin, No one of us lives for himself. Its purpose was for the extension of the kingdom of heaven through Masonic channels. Wow. Although he sought to build a kingdom on earth, it most certainly had nothing to do with the God of the Bible. Simbragi. I hope I'm saying that right. The newly revised Order of the Mustard Seed encourages inductees to diligently prepare for taking the vow by co-joining themselves to a community of other like-minded vow takers. Those in the preparation stage leading up to the taking of the vow join with others who are likewise in preparation. These fellow vow takers encourage and support one another in their journey towards full inclusion into the Order. The lead up to the day of the vow taking is compared in anticipatory importance to the preparation for one's wedding vows. They have chosen to call the order supportive communities of vow takers, Simbragi. Below you will see the description of these communities in their own vernacular. Quote, we have adopted the ancient Celtic word Simbragi, meaning companions of the heart, to describe the communities that are emerging, gathered around the Zinzendorf story and the vows of the mustard seed order. Simbrogi or Simbragi are more than acquaintances. They are co covenant companions, life friends, brothers and sisters in arms. In arms. Kimbrogi is an ancient Celtic word and is pronounced, thanks, Kumbrogi. Okay, Kumbrogi. 
The purveyors of this order claim the word simply means companions of the heart. However, Kumbrogi can also mean sword brothers, and I suspect this definition is more in line with their intended meaning. It has been variously translated along the lines of fellow countrymen, companions of the heart, and the one that best captures our intent, sword brothers. In this context, a sword brother is one who has covenanted to stand with his comrades in battle for noble causes and would gladly forfeit his life for his brother in arms. Curiously enough, the Arthurian legend refers to the Brotherhood of Knights committed to Arthur as Cumbrogi. It is intriguing in light of the avid fascination some Dominionists have with the Arthurian legend. The connection between the use of the word in the Arthurian legend and the use of the word among those resurrecting the ancient order of the mustard seed is more than likely not coincidence. Cumbrogi, quote, Cumbrogi, he calls us, companions of the heart, fellow countrymen, Cumbrogi, we are his strong arm, his shield and spear, his blade and helm. We are the blood in his veins, the hard sinew of his flesh, the bone beneath the skin. We are the breath in his lungs, the clear light in his eyes, and the song rising to his lips. We are the meat and drink at his board, Cumbrogi. We are the earth and sky to him, and Arthur is all these things to us and more. Unquote. Lord of the Ring The website for the Order of the Mustard Seed prominently displays a famous quote from Frodo, the main character in Tolkien's novel Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, as most of you will no doubt be aware, was later made into an epic and award-winning film. Quote, I will take the ring, though I do not know the way. Unquote. That's Frodo. It is curious to me why the procurators of this order would choose this quote. In the movie Lord of the Rings, the ring is clearly evil, and the seat of its power is called Mount Doom. At the moment, when the main character Frodo feels as though he's finally mastered the ring, the ring takes complete and utter mastery of him, turning his will into its. Hmm. Meet the new conspirators, same as the old. In researching the resurrection of this order, I happened across a website entitled The Mustard Seed Associates. The Mustard Seed Associates are those who have embraced the lifestyle and philosophy of the Mustard Seed Order. Curiously enough, they describe themselves as the new conspirators. They explain that when a church lives in isolation, it cuts itself off from God's conspiracy. What may, what may you ask is God's conspiracy? It is a conspiracy to refashion the world and craft a new global community. While I can agree that it is certainly a conspiracy, I must disagree that the conspiracy has anything whatsoever to do with God. The website prominently displayed a book for which the undiscerning could exchange their cash for the Gnostic New Age agenda of the New Conspirators. The book was entitled, appropriately enough, The New Conspirators Creating the One the world one mustard seed at a time. I'm going to say that again. Creating the world one mustard seed at a time. I have included its synopsis below. Quote, the new conspirators, Tom Sign, helps us to think critically and creatively about the world we've inherited and the global community we're crafting. Strained schedules and divided loyalties, the rising cost of housing, emerging political and economic realities, the plight of the global poor, the vulnerability of the environment, he then shares stories of churches and ministries that have planted hope in these troubled soils with in inimitable insight and delight. Sign commissions this mustard seed generation to refashion the world according to God's great vision, unquote. Notice, it is the new mustard seed generation who is going to refashion the world and craft a new global community, not God. These words take on a new and ominous meaning when you consider that they are committed dominionists who believe they are mandated to dominate and subdue the earth using whatever means necessary. Perhaps it will be clearer now that the, ter the term sword brothers does in fact belie their true mission. Theirs is an aggressive geopolitical and social agenda to unite all faiths and refashion the world. There will be a, a world church that unites around Christ, unfortunately, it will be the Antichrist.
Aggressive Dominionist Agenda Dominionists possess a radical socio-political agenda, and like a well-oiled military machine, they are well-organized and their network vast. Their ultimate socio-political goal is a one-world church and a new world order. Pause. I'm going to show you. I'm going to leave a link below for the video I put out about building the, the kingdom, which is actually a podcast that somebody else did about the historical evidence for inserting the Dominionist agenda into the church so that they would build a one world religion to go along with the one world order. Unpause. Okay. They believe they will go, um, they believe they will go forth like a vast army, Joel's army, that was me, yielded to the authority of the new apostles and conquer the world's kingdoms for Christ to usher in the millennial reign. These kingdoms consist of all social and political institutions and those who do not wish to be ruled will be slaughtered. Those who do not wish to be ruled will be slaughtered. With the world under their complete dominion, they will hand over the reins to Christ so that he may return to earth. However, the Bible makes it clear that at the time of Christ's return, the earth will be in complete and utter chaos and his return will prevent what would otherwise be the complete annihilation of the earth in the Great Tribulation. This doctrine of dominionism makes the church the Savior and not Jesus Christ. I'm saying that again. This doctrine of dominionism makes the church the Savior and not Jesus Christ. Christ alone can and will institute God's rule on earth. Yes. Yes. Okay. Many dominionists belie, um, believe that the church is Christ. Yes, they do. Many dominionists believe that the church is Christ and that Christ will literally be incarnated within the church to be enabled it to enable it to take control and evolve to the next level. This is the manifest sons of God. I don't think she's saying those words, but this is what it is. Okay. This is, of course, hand in hand with what New Agers, Gnostics, Kabbalists, and secret societies believe. The New Agers teach that we are converging towards an omega point, whereby man's collective consciousness will unify and be transformed or transubstantiated into Christ. Let me boil that down for you into something easily digestible. They believe and teach that, that we will become God. They term this the Christ consciousness, yet it has nothing to do with the Christ of the Bible. They believe and teach that Jesus was merely a man turned into the highest range of consciousness and vibrational frequency they call the glory of oneness. At this level, they teach one has the most enlightenment as a man. At this level, they teach one has the most enlightenment. As a man, Jesus was able to access this level, and thus it is called the Christ consciousness. The New Agers insist that as mankind unifies, we will collectively reach the Omega point, and a quantum leap in evolution will occur, whereby we will all access this higher consciousness and become Christ. They believe that man's collective consciousness is essentially moving towards a glorious pinnacle and evolving into Godhood. This is not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that we are collectively moving towards the opposite, social unrest, the collapse of world systems, and the Antichrist. There are a list of references here. I will leave a link to this article below. But I'm going to read some of the comments underneath of this because I found it extremely interesting. Someone asks, is it true that Amos Kamenis wrote the Constitution for the Masonic Lodge of England? And she said, I'm not sure. And this person, again, on March 5th, this is 2014, by the way. This person says, this is, this is a person's comment. They're quoting from a book. I just ordered it on Amazon, so maybe I'll be reading that. I found Amos Kaminsky, Kamenius, referenced on page 153 in Occult Theocracy by Lady Queensborough, which was first published in 1933. This particular chapter deals with the Rosicrucians. 
At that time, Comenius was the bishop of the Moravian community and leader of the Moravian Brethren, a sect pledged to achieve the extermination of the Catholic Church and which, being considered heretical, was also suspected of practicing secret Satanism. The Moravians were imbued with Socinianism, which has been spread among them by Faustus Socinius who, as a Rosicrucian, helped compose the Masonic Eight Degree, which was Satanic, page 155, who had found refuge in Moravia when persecuted by the Church. Their link with Rosicrucianism has already been established in the person of the pietist Julius Sperber, who was also one of their leaders. When Kaminsky, Kamenius, was persecuted he first went to london in 1641 can you believe we're reading about this stuff from 1641 and early the next year went to sweden where he was granted refuge by the help of the powerful swedish minister count axel ozenstern himself a rosicrucian adept and protector of another initiate ludwig van greer from holland the combination of the pursuit of alchemy and hermeticism with political aims was frequently evidenced even before the official appearance of the Rosicrucianism. The influence of adepts on the destinies of nations was immense. I also found another specific reference to Comenius on page 173 in his great work, Pan Sophia. At that time, Comenius was working with a man named Andrea. Andrea. Comenius is stated to have been interested in spiritism, prophecies, revolution, antichrist, the millennium, and such whims of dangerous fanaticism. He and his and in this Andrea were working on a book slash vision which advocated a human utopia. They worked to help unite old traditions of practical masonry with the more recent development and broaden ideas of the New World League. On page 170, I found a specific reference to Zinzendorf, which states that that which states that was said to have been the head of the rose cross from 1744 to 1749 i've only seen one of the reference that confirms this however if what this woman has set out in her book is true it would certainly seem to indicate that the new world order and the roots and origins of it and its philosophies need to be searched out and what it needs to be searched out and what is in the darkness veiled in robes of religious sheep's wool must be brought to the light and tested in Jesus' holy name. Derek Prince once stated in his sermon entitled The Harvest Ahead that when the very real fifth column of the occult were exposed and eradicated out of the church, that there would be a glorious revival as the world has never seen. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Matthew 24. But wait! There's more! Hey. So now we're looking into Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. And I'm just warning you right now, there is some actually rather disgusting and um, kind of pervy things in this article. But I am going to skip words that are gross and anything I will just, I will skip and I'll just give you the basic idea. Okay? One does not need a prestigious co theological college to discern that the doctrine that Zinzendorf embraced is unorthodox and heretical. Zinzendorf's sermons, writings, and self-written hymns testify this. In excerpts taken from his sermons, Zinzendorf belittles and debases both Christ and the apostles and calls the Trinity, quote, good for nothing but to amuse dogs and swine, unquote. He believes the Holy Spirit is the wife of God and refers to Christ's manner of speech as that of a, quote, of quote, a peasant, a carpenter, a fisherman, or a man brought up among toll gatherers, unquote. In one of Zinzendorf's sermons, he insists Christ is feeble-minded, claiming he has not one more thought than was needful of him. In referring to Christ being tempted to turn stones to bread after his 40-day fast in the wilderness, Zinzendorf claims Christ's answers are illogical and foolish, 
He further insists that Christ deemed himself useless and good for nothing, and that many of the things the Lord stated in Scripture are not fit to be examined. Alarmingly, Zinzendorf goes as far as to tell his congregation that Christ had nothing extraordinary in his turn of mind or gifts. Furthermore, Zinzendorf states that at the cross, Jesus did not have enough intelligence to arm himself like a great genius. Instead, he was like the poorest of creatures who in all their straits fall into downright convulsions. He further demeans Christ by calling him their little Jesus and by feminizing him as their little mama Jesus. Evidently, it would appear from such comments that Zinzendorf considered Jesus weak, cowardly, intellectually deficient, and devoid of any talents or abilities. Consequently, by the words of his mouth, he stands opposed to Orthodox Christian doctrine and thought. Not surprisingly, Zinzendorf denied the deity of Christ, the bedrock upon which all Orthodox Christian doctrine stands, and instead insisted that Christ had no more power than we have. In one sermon, Zinzendorf imagined Jesus as a mere woodworker in heaven, hewing timber as the house carpenter of a little village, or making plows and other utensils for his neighbors. While all this perspective alone provides proof of his unorthodox views, his scathing rebuke of the apostles adds additional evidence. In a sermon delivered to one of his Moravian settlements in the Dutch city of Zeist, he refers to the apostles as ignorant tricksters not fit to be trusted. All of these are quoted. I'm just, they're in parentheses. I'm just trying to read through this. It is his belief that the apostles have wrongly cut the cloth and laid a weak foundation, spoiling Christ's plan. He insists that St. Paul and St. John accommodated themselves too much to the times and were thus in, incapable of serving as a pattern for us. In this same sermon, Zinzendorf alleges that Christ felt pain in his entrails when he thought about the fact that the apostles would later commit false tricks to mar his plan. Strangely enough, Zinzendorf goes on to, goes on to claim it will be centuries before, before Christ will finally find someone to trust with the execution of his plan. This view is understandable considering Zinzendorf believed there had been no real church in existence before him and that God had chosen him to start the true church and reveal his actual plan. Wow, doesn't that sound familiar? Don't we hear the gnarly saying that too? Zinzendorf believed that the reading of scripture was far more dangerous than beneficial to his society. Considering Zinzendorf's non-scriptural beliefs, his disdain of Bible reading makes sense. Andrew Frey, a former Moravian who had lived in the settlement on Zinzendorf's estate, testified that the sect believed the Bible to be loathsome dung fit only to be spit upon. When a person abandoned scripture, they also abandoned the Mosaic law upon which all Orthodox Christian doctrine rests. Without the restraint of this law, there exists no biblical morality. A person then feels free to embrace antinomianism and instead do what seems right in his own eyes. This casting off the restraint of law was precisely what happened with Zinzendorf. Predictably, antinomianism ensued. Eventually, Zinzendorf's antinomianism gave rise to openly erotic and perverse behavior that took place commonly within his sect. Antinomians believe that New Testament Christians are under a new dispensation of grace, freeing them from the confines of obedience to Mosaic law. Zinzendorf, in fact, took this freedom one step further by discarding the, dis the confines of Scripture altogether. He believed instead that this was a new era and that now Christ expressed his will directly and exclusively to both Zinzendorf and his elders, eliminating the need for Scripture altogether. Also reminds me of the prophets today that want to replace the Bible with themselves. As Christ Vice Regent Zinzendorf was conveniently free to declare that his sect's lewd and licentious behavior sanctified by God and therefore holy. This kind of salvation provided him with the freedom to gratify all sensual proclivities, including making use of other men's wives and daughters and holding orgiastic meetings under the guise of worship. Zinzendorf was a sexual deviant who exacted totalitarian control over the sex lives of his followers. He believed that human sexual unions symbolized the mystical marriage between Christ and his church. 
the believer and the divine. The act of copulation became so elevated in his community that he referred to it as a sacrament and viewed it as a liturgical act. Zinzendorf gave explicit instructions to all couples regarding the act of copulation, its frequencies and the various positions available to them. There were regular conjugal laws established and these were observed by all members of the sect. Certain hours and quarters were set up for these matters and meetings known as love feasts, ended with couples making love in full view of other parishioners. Zinzendorf considered himself chief deputy of Christ on earth in adjusted marriages by making couples switch partners whenever it so pleased him. Sometimes mass adjustments were performed, and young girls and boys were forced together and made to perform difficile copulation astride wooden benches. All marriages performed outside the community were considered void, and all marriages performed within the community had to have the initial consummatory copulative act witnessed by Zinzendorf and his elders. In History of the Moravians, there appears a testimony from a young married woman by the name of Joanna Elizabeth Pabst, who testified under oath that all newly married couples were initiated into the conjugal mysteries by performing sex in the presence of elders. Zinzendorf governed not just the copulatory act itself, but the offspring it produced. Parents had to relinquish parental rights before they were allowed to join the community, so Zinzendorf could legally take these children from the parents and raise them communally. It was common for Zinzendorf to take children to his personal residence to instruct them, and he was sometimes observed to have nine or ten such children in his bedchamber overnight. One is left to contemplate what instruction these children might need that required an overnight stay in the bedroom of an adult man. It is conceivable the Count was instructing the boy... I will not read that. Okay. Zinzendorf often left his Countess at home and traveled abroad to, with a very young girl by the name of Anna Nichman. He made her an eldress of the church at a tender age of 14, a title by all rights which should have belonged to his wife. It gave the young girl an enormous amount of influence and power in the lives of the community's women. The young Anna Nitschman had been brought to the Zinzendorf home at a very young age after Zinzendorf had bribed the girl's father to adopt him or her. This sham adoption deflected any outrage that might arise over their relationship because it was seen as totally permissible for a brother to be alone with his sister. In exchange for going along with the charade, the girl's father was allowed entrance um, into the sex inner circle and became a leading figure in the early days. She remained in the Zinzendorf home for, for many years and eventually married Zinzendorf, her adopted brother, soon after the death of his wife. Certainly, it would be fair to conclude that the adoption only served as a thin veneer of respectability to cloak his ongoing sexual relationship with the young girl. He says a lot of really gross, disgusting things, and I'm not going to read them. Undeniably, much of the sex lascivious behavior was committed under the pretenses of devotion to the blood and wounds of Christ. Zinzendorf and his Moravians worshipped the five wounds of Christ. The comp contemplation, adoration, and rumination of these wounds produced group arousal that included language comparable to sexual fetishism. Although they lavished their devotion on all Christ's wounds, including, disturbingly enough, his... And I'm going to skip some more. I am going to skip some more. It's really gross, and I'm not going to read it, but it just shows you... This guy gets talked about. I've seen other videos where they go on and on about Zinzendorf. And if you go online and do any research, you will see nothing but good stuff. Um, it's so weird. The cult... Oh, nope. Not reading that either. Their deification of these wounds, in essence, gave them license to commit acts that were not in keeping with orthodoxy because they self-justified their intemperance by reason of their devotion to these wounds. Evidently, the community held that any who had taken abode in the wounds could commit no sin since the Lord was so delighted with their support, their sportiveness. It is clear that a re-evaluation of our historical view of Zinzendorf is in order. This is especially true given the infusion and proliferation of his heterodoxic doctrine into modern Pentecostalism. 
and especially into the neo-Pentecostal ultra-right-wing Dominionist groups. This propagation is very alarming to consider because many of the hardcore Dominionist groups today seek the complete subjugation of civil government to their control. Therefore, this insidious doctrine that elevates progressive revelation through alleged direct contact with the spirit world over established Christian doctrine is highly dangerous to both religious adherents and society in general. It is not immediately apparent why this material about Zinzendorf has been hidden, ignored, or glossed over by historians. However, it is apparent that the re-emergence of Zinzendorf's doctrine within these religious circles makes a re-evaluation of the man critically important. Although Zinzendorf is known today as a social reformer and gifted theologian, the abundant evidence of his non-Orthodox doctrine, sexually deviant proclivities, and blood and wound theology surely disqualify him from such venerable praise. Run. There's just one name that can keep you out of hell, and it's the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus.